everybody hello and welcome to popcorn culture my name is ben carlin and i am your host here with me today is my brother jay who will be in every episode in every episode just getting back from the grid the, as, oh yeah hey were. i know although we're we're doing the the fun thing where we're, yeah. we're talking in the future about things that haven't happened yet but we're excited because the reason why we need to record this particular episode early is because we were once again invited down to disney world yes. uh to experience the new tron attraction tron uh, light cycle run yes uh within Tomorrowland at the magic kingdom at disney world in orlando florida man so many qualifiers yeah yeah disney world oh this, my gosh so yeah um the, uh, as we are recording this it is it is uh we are recording this seven days before it's being released so we were recording it on friday yes and actually as this episode comes out we will already be back in roanoke but between now and when this episode comes out we will have gone down to disney world and experienced the the tron light cycle run and many other things that like they've planned for us which sounds like it's going to be such a fun week. There is no there can be no doubt whatsoever that like it's like the I I know uh like just on the basis of like the job that we do I feel like when I meet like other uh like parents out in the world or like you know just people run into us old teachers and stuff like that they're like oh my kids that's all they talk about they want to be influencers or they want to be TikTok stars or they yeah. want to make videos on YouTube or Twitch stream or or, or something like that you know yeah. like and I know like so many um like professions like like i was listening to a podcast where um people were talking about being like broadway actors and this perception that it's like like almost as if it's like an easy thing to do like it's like you're just gonna go and like do a play or something like which right, like, i don't think that many people are like under this like illusion that being a broadway actor would be like easy but yeah. um obviously it's like tons and tons and tons of training and preparation and education and you know all the all the things that lead you to the moment um but it's not all necessarily like you know bright lights glitz glam all the rest there's like the underbelly of every job that you do that's always like it, it's kind of like the harsh reality i think sometimes of something that otherwise seems so so like bright and magical oh, absolutely absolutely i remember once upon a time uh how how appropriate for this story i'm about to tell uh working at the the concert venue i used to work at bingo nice yeah, bingo for anyone still playing the bingo card out there which you should be doing um <laughs> we had we had beauty and the beast coming for broadway and yep. uh there was like this big little extra story for roanoke because i think the person who played like the ottoman like went to went to our high school oh cool that's know, so fun which was cool so i was like oh man they're, you're, they're coming to their hometown and you know they, they so that while this person would normally not be part of like the press circuit or anything because it was roanoke they were but along the way they also sent along their regular people like the person playing bell or whatever and i remember the like just hearing the facts that you know uh, about how they cast this particular person it's like you know there was 500 other people who auditioned to play bell or whatever and it's just right. like, and she won out and it's like boy i that is it's like that like the level of talent it must take to get on stage is crazy because this is to play bell in the traveling broadway production of beauty and the beast not like the static one that sits at new york city that you think of when you think of broadway right you yes know, it's like and there were 500 people auditioning for that and uh it's like yeah, it, it's pretty crazy. And like, even if you land like a crazy Broadway gig, it's like shows don't last on Broadway forever. It's not like great. I've got I work for Broadway now. I'll just be on that. St I'll just be doing right. my thing at, at some yeah. point in time. Yeah, it's like there's there's probably like the bittersweet ending to where it's like, oh, it's my last performance as Belle. Right. And it's also like also I need a job. Right. Um, which my suspicion is that if you have played Belle on Broadway, you're probably in you're probably good. real good shape. But if you're uh, like dancer whatever. number four. Like, you know, like, I mean, no doubt you're a thousand times more talented than me. Oh, uh, I mean, yes. You know, like, but like you, you, you might not have that like crazy name recognition, but you still had to have the crazy talent to get up there. Yes, 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 yes. No, I, I, I totally, I totally know where you're coming from. Uh, even when I was watching uh, the like the little docu series like Welcome to Wrexham, which is like the um, it's the story about Ryan Reynolds and Rob McElhaney purchasing like a um, like a like a football club in uh, Wales, 
And like they would even they would even do like a little thing on there were like this group of three players who like you think of them as like, you know, professional footballers. Like right. in our minds, especially as like Americans, where like professional athletes essentially equates to like you have a fantastic living like because that's predominantly right. what it feels like and, and and I'm sure there are plenty of situations or even people listening where it's like oh but not always and I'm sure that's that's also true but like this was an interesting thing uh where like three of these guys are professional footballers and they live in like a small apartment together and like the right. inside of their apartment they have like three TVs that are back to back to back and they sit on like you know um uh, like like beanbag chairs effectively playing like Call of Duty with each other and like they <laughs> that's amazing r- right like they like <laughs> ride like, a- to w- like work together in like one car they carpool you know they get there but like it's like you you have this idea about what their life might be like and then it's like when you see it you're kind of like oh man like these guys are like they're they're still trying to earn their stripes right you know like it's it's definitely still like they're they're still in like that slog type situation and and like with with things like that you know it's like anything else where there can be turnover and then it's kind of like okay i was a professional footballer yesterday but like not not for always right yeah um so anyway i would say that like to bring it back to to the point i was trying to make for our trip to disney next week um i think that like as as these people who have made like like created content on the internet like we've we've had the conversation with people before where it's kind of this like there's an odd piece of pressure to this particular career which is that like there's there's not like anybody before us who has lived an entire career doing the job that that we're trying to do now right like there's not uh there's not like a a field guide for how to influencer. Yes, exactly. Like YouTube right. was invented in, in 2007, I believe. Yeah. So, so like after, or at least after I graduated high school. Right. So right. it wasn't even something like, like that's the other weird thing. Like, you know, growing up, people are like, what do you want? Like people ask me, you know, people ask you when you're growing up, what do you want to do when you grow up? And it's always, I, that always felt like such a, like a pressure filled question. Cause I just never really had an answer right. for what I wanted that to be. And it's so funny that like, given what we do now, like I never could have even answered this. Yes. yes. You know, the best I could have said was like a professional blogger or something. Right. And like th- th- that, that was even then that was hardly a thing. Right. And that wasn't even what I aspired to. So, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So, and even now it's like, I feel like there's a little bit of squabbling over like what to even call mm-hmm. our, our career itself. We kind of, I feel like you and I have like haphazardly tried to commit to the term uploaders before. And I don't feel like it's ever really stuck. So yeah. you can't, I mean, maybe, maybe we're just content creators. Maybe it's just, it just has to be that. But, um, the, the idea there though. So like I said, you know, like YouTube was invented in the year 2007. We started our channel in 2012. So like, if you want to look at your traditional career being about a 40 year span, this thought would, it's like the, this is like the daunting thought that I feel like keeps me up at night sometimes, but it's like the, like in the year 2052, you know, like that would be a 40 year span of time. Right. Like Like, a traditional career length traditional career length yeah so like if you were to like in the the same capacity that like our mom is like an accountant you know like conceivably graduated college with this degree started in that field continued to be in that field you know throughout the course of her right life adult life yes um that like that is that that is like the big question i think a lot of times in my mind is i'm like like you know you try to think about like the year 2052 and you try to think about that possibility of like like when i am like 60 years old is is there a chance that i am still saying the words hey brother right you yeah. know like, like are <laughs> you are you uploading and offering your opinions on movies and breaking down easter eggs and right right stuff like that and it's like i don't know but then i i don't know I, like other times you think of like famous movie reviewers like i don't like when i think of like siskel and ebert or something like i don't picture them as like you know really young people sure you know sure the 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 question in my mind is always like will we uh like will we like climb some type of of hierarchy within the world because that's the other thing too is like with so many other careers there's there's you know the the corporate ladder so to speak or whatever like you Uh know you might you might start as an associate and work your way up to like partner named partner senior vice president something i don't know they always have fun terms for people as you work work your way up but it's like as as the individual content creator themselves there is no there's no vertical, <laughs> like, yeah, right. like you know. It's like I like I don't know what else I like. You're I wouldn't. There's no vertical, but there's like a there's a, 
I mean, there's there's a difference between like us and like like Rhett and Link or like Mr. Beast or something. You know? yeah, yeah. There like, sure is. Room to there go. sure is. Yeah. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's true. That's true. I mean, but like, you know, on some level, this is, this is uh, like, you know, I, I, I don't even know. I don't even know. But uh, that being said, all I was really trying to say though, is that like, there's, there's ups and downs to every career. And I know that like, uh, definitely, definitely like on the, on the, uh, like the viewing side of things, there's a chance that it just like, that it seems like, like super fun and, and like awesome all the time. And, and it's hard to sometimes see like the other pressures yeah. that might yeah, come with it for sure. Um, but that being said, this next week is like one of those instances where, where it is just impossible not to be like, this is so this is, cool. I, know, <laughs> like, like, we, I mean, we've been very lucky to get to go to Disney world, like a bunch of, like a, a few times now, like, um, the four trips of this nature. Yes. And like the, like uh this one in particular seems like all of the things have really aligned and it's like i i am so excited for this next one i think it's it gonna, gonna be, be it's uh, gonna be exceptionally exceptionally cool uh yeah. like even even on the the call as they were kind of like giving us the breakdown of of everything that we were going to be doing it was like this like spectacular kind of suspense that they were building because like on the one they're telling you like a lot of the stuff that you're going to be doing and it's already awesome it's like yeah we got you guys like arranged for here you're gonna be here doing this we're gonna have the lightning lanes for those you you know like all this like really cool stuff and they're also like we also want to keep a few surprises from you guys so you it's can like, be surprised when we get here it's like, like everything you, you mean <laughs> like everything you just said sounded awesome like it was already cool yeah so hopefully as you're listening to this you've already been seeing our stories all week and you already know what we're talking about and you have this weird amount of knowledge about what we've done that we recording it now don't have exactly it's a really surreal experience for you it absolutely will yeah. be i think <laughs> it's gonna be really fun and alice and beth are both getting to come I with know, us alice on this particular journey come with us and it's like we just I, it's like we were just at disney world like a few weeks like uh few, weeks is still the right word i feel like weeks is still it's not still yeah right it's like, like barely month months ago. yeah, yeah. Barely a month ago and uh that was like a whole different trip that was like as big family all the kids as we could possibly go and this is this couldn't be more the opposite where it's just me you uh beth and alice and it's just like all right now we're in like turbo not only that we don't have to plan it they planned everything for us i know i know yeah, yeah. and it's like they're they're goal too like while you're there is to make sure that you're having as much fun as possible getting to do as many things as possible and so like there is this like huge added advantage like to you know like a well-prepared person going on a trip to disney who's like been there and knows the ins and outs and like who like where to be and when and rope drop and lightning lanes and all the rest it's like it's like this it's set up it, it's like cheat codes i literally feel like and this this uh reference might date me a lot but it's the uh like when we were kids you could buy uh for like the sega genesis something called a game shark yeah and game shark was like literally like a cartridge that you would stick in and then you would stick your game cartridge on a cartridge receptacle on top of the game shark itself and what the game shark would allow you to do is cheat yeah <laughs> like but like intentionally inten- yeah, yeah it was, it was i a- think for sega it was called a game genie oh then. you're right yeah. I, and of course mm-hmm. i got it wrong and of course yeah. you remember yeah game yeah. shark i want to say is what we had for the game boy um, is that right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, I, I don't think we ever owned the game shark for game boy but i do remember once upon a time uh i was at a chess tournament uh it must have been in seventh grade yeah had to been in seventh grade okay and someone there paul uh who was the the best chess player on our on our team i suppose amazing he had a game shark and i remember thinking and he had like printed out all the like this is how this is how it was he had a game shark and he had like printed out all the different codes you might use in like pokemon to get certain stuff oh interesting yeah okay. and so like the way chess tournaments work is that there's a lot of time between rounds because chess takes a long time right so you just you know you'd go play your game and then you'd come back and um, you know, you just hang out with your little look at all the people you were there with. And so what we did was bust up the game shark. And I remember thinking like, this is my opportunity. I have to get as much out of this as possible. Sure. So this, and this was the, uh, like it, to get, to get Mew on your Pokemon game, 
uh, back then, you either had to go to like a physical event, like at a Toys R Us or something, and like receive the data. Oh my god! This is the only. Way. I mean, this is honestly still how it is. With like a lot of mythical Pokemon. I guess that's fair. Um, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they want to make it really hard to get. They want to like make you go do the thing to earn it or whatever. Or you could have a Game Shark. Yeah. Which is uh, the other way to do it. Sorry, I got my Mew. I got my Mew, and then I was like, I'm gonna restart the game, and I, I've got that, and then I'm gonna like, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna make it so that I can catch in the grass like a like a, a really unique six member team to start with and i remember that was like my most fun playthrough ever because i just had like pokemon i would otherwise never use because i had them from the beginning right and it right was, yeah I, I still remember that playthrough which is i don't know uh still fun i guess no it's it's the most yeah. fun it's the most fun yeah i think the other one we did this with was uh we we potentially rented the game gd i feel like from like the nearby it wasn't a blockbuster we didn't have a blockbuster it was called movie stars yeah and i feel like you could you could rent like in, like you know you go in and like mom and dad like pick out a game or whatever but one of the things you could also rent was the game genie and uh so you could go home and we hooked it up to golden eye I, I believe it was for what, what was it for n64 it must have been something um because that's what i specifically remember is we we used the cheat code so that you could run through doors and once you could run through doors you could organically unlock all of the things inside of the game of GoldenEye, like they would have challenges, for example, where it's like you could get like a gold finish, which would get you like the like the golden gun uh, oh. for multiplayer mode or something. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. GoldenEye was like, how fast can you beat each level at like various difficulties? Yes. Yeah, and if you could like beat this level under like six minutes, then you would unlock a new cheat code. Right, and the or thing, an, yeah, the thing was though, was that it was like it was immensely difficult. But Game mm -hmm. Genie or Game Shark or whatever we had at the time would let you run through the doors, and I think it would also like auto fill objectives. So literally, <laughs> all you had to do was sprint through the level. And I remember in some instances it was still hard. It was still hard, and I was like, no one is doing this. Nobody is ever unlocking the RCP90 organically. Right, yeah. Because like, come on. Th this is impossible with cheat codes. <laughs> anyway, so that was, a, that was a fun trip down memory lane. Yeah, man, man. Played a lot of GoldenEye back in the day. We sure did. We yeah. should bring it back. We should bring it back. Bring it back, yeah. man. I bet it looks terrible. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Anyway, uh, so Disney trip next week. It's going to be so much fun. In the meantime, transition. Transition! Jay, you mentioned uh, you mentioned a little bit of chess action, and I, 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 I yeah. thought for sure that you were you were setting up for a segue based on something we had in the show notes. So I'm I'm just going to set you up. Oh, for the, I was I was like I was putting it out there. I was like, ooh, I recognize an opportunity here. Yeah. to like uh, to throw a doorknob out there. <laughs> oh, that'll come back later. That'll come back later. Don't nice. worry. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, just remember uh, that. So obviously now you've grabbed said doorknob for the conversation and go ahead. What can I? What can I? What can I say? What can I say? I'm a. Yeah. I'm a. I'm a giver i think in this scenario it would be a giver that'll make sense later <laughs> yeah we'll come back to it tell me about chess tell you about chess. okay what what happened in the world of chess lately that was oh, interesting oh, oh 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 yes 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 well in my own personal life um like me and L luke and me continued to play yes a bunch. he likes I, to play before bed we we did uh we talked <clears throat> last week on the pop about the the um pierogi night uh, perils, yeah. as it were, yes, we Pierogi Night that went that went astray. And whilst at Pierogi Night, I remember Luke coming up to me and saying that for his birthday, which is in November, which yeah. honestly I was a little bit like, oh, we are we are related. <laughs> 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 right? He was like, Daddy's gonna get me like a like a rainbow chess a set. Rainbow chess set. And I was like, What? That is so cool. I'm mm -hmm. so glad you already have it picked out. And he was like, he could just like tell that he was just like lighting up about it. And like I watched him like walk through the room and go over to mom and he was like, Hey Nana, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he told her too. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is so cute. Yeah. So uh yeah, so yeah, so yeah. Uh, since then he has uh, replaced whether or not he wants a rainbow chess set with various other um, themed chess things from like Mario to Star Wars to Mickey to Bluey to whatever. Uh, uh, oh, a Bluey it chess It changes set. a lot. And then we yeah. have to look up to see if it exists. And a lot of times like someone on Etsy will have made a version, but it's like they just glued a bunch of plastic to the town. I'm like this one's not very good. But, sure, 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 yeah. sure. Yeah, um, I did bring, we have like the night, we actually have a very nice like Pokemon chess set that we've had at the office for a long time that's just sort of been sitting in a corner. And I was like, I'm bringing this home because I know someone who's going to love it. I, and yeah, that, that yeah, tracks. So I, I managed to get it open, and I swear that chest sounds like a piece of furniture. It's like heavy and enormous, and I like bumped into a hundred things moving it. But 
Anyway, I brought it home last night. I set it up and I like sneakily got Luke out of the room and like showed him the other room. And he, his like the, the his face just lit. And I was like, <gasps> like what Pokemon chess? And then you know it's like it's so funny to me that he wants like all these different themed chess sets because like it's the same game. Hey, no oh yeah, yeah, what. no, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But like I think this is like uh, this is even like like dice, you know, for yeah. for Dungeons and Dragons. It's like yeah, it's like they all do and say the same things, but right. it's like doesn't stop me from wanting all the really pretty cool looking ones yeah yeah so that was fun and then we were playing with it and so the the pokemon chest that has rapidash for the knights because it's a horse oh yeah naturally luke Luke decided his rapidash had a special power where it could sit in the center on the center of the board like right in the middle of the eight by eight grid not in any particular square and what its power was that every turn it could steal a piece and then go back to the center so i lost pretty handily (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 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 yeah that's uh i don't want to say it's um needs to be like maybe like toned yeah. down a little yeah. bit. It yeah. was a little broken. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> I was gonna say, but you know, it's it's fine. We're playing. We're just you know, we're just getting used to using the pieces and everything. And he knows how they work anyway. But congrats but so. to Luke on getting his first big win. There's no doubt. Yeah. There's no doubt. Now speaking of big wins, we talked a while ago on the pop about uh, a really fun chess move called en passant. En passant. Which yeah. when you're a kid and you find out you can do this move, it's like mind blowing, and it's the only thing you want to do because it's like it feels like you're like using a cheat code but in chess yeah oh yeah 100 yeah. this is this is like literally i feel like the uh the thing like i i think that like easter eggs in movies is yeah. like like if you really wanted to try to like like uh break down what you and i do on like the super carlin brothers channel and like the most easily like like transferable way to someone who maybe has no idea like what like a fan theory might be yeah it seems like people generally know like like easter eggs exist right there there are these fun things that you can spot in the background that have been left there on purpose and like people seem to to generally understand that i feel like the fact that en passant stood out to us so much w- was like an early marker that we were going to be endlessly fascinated because yeah um, it, like it, it's not but it feels like an easter egg of the game it's like there's right. these like special circumstances under which it's possible and like exactly. not everybody probably even knows it exists but when you do when you get to use it when you get to use <sighs> it it is epic and so um it, it is fun if you don't know it's like it, it's like when when your pawn starts you can move it two spaces and i think the move the reason the move exists is because sometimes people will try and do that to like like escape being captured by an enemy pawn by like oh now i just landed next to you and then but if you do that uh, then the pawn can just move like behind you and take you, even though they're not landing on your square. It's, I don't know. Look it up. It's fun. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, so recently in the greater world of chess, um, there was a guy named Magnus Carlsen. Yep. Who is the uh, hands down best chess player in the world? Right. I mean, with a name like Magnus, how could you not be? <laughs> I, it's true. It's true. I mean, it, like, like it, it, it seems like the movie is just writing I itself. Know. The, the na- when they named their kid Magnus Carlson, they, they, they're like, well, that's pretty much it. We think we did everything we had to do. This person will be the best at chess. Now. <laughs> the seed has been planted. It there. will now grow. Right. So anyway, uh, I guess recently he was playing. I don't know how recently, but he was playing in uh, a game of bullet chess. Okay. And. Um, he found himself in a situation where he, the, he, I guess he sequenced wrong. I guess the point of the game is you're supposed to like play really fast. Okay. And I guess the, with were, a name like bullet. Yeah. Yeah. With a name like bullet chess. Yeah. You're playing really fast. You have like very low time constraints and, um, like there was a sequence of thing where he should have moved Bishop King, but he did King first and then Bishop. And this like changed the whole game. Like suddenly, like if you had like a computer generated monitor, like it, as soon as he made the wrong move, like it jumped up and said like, Oh, there's a, there's a possible mate on the board in 11 moves. Like this will happen. Okay. Or like it can happen. And like, if you, 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 the, the normal person are staring at the board, you would never find it. But like the people playing the game, like Magnus realizes it immediately. Oh like, you know? no. And it's like, but, but, but so does his opponent and what and this is what was so cool is that like he i think he just sort of realized like oops made a mistake but as it like plays out the possible mate in his mind he realizes how it has to happen and it is like crazy and because it's so crazy instead of just conceding in the moment he 
plays it out because the way it worked was that after they played like 10 more moves, the 11th move involved the opponent using on passant to capture a pawn and then also checkmate the king with said pawn. Wow. Which was like crazy. And so what what's so fun about it is that he clearly realized that like, I'm going to lose to en passant. We are absolutely doing this. That's <laughs> you know? awesome. It's like for the yeah. love of the game. Exactly, for the love <laughs> of the game. So it's like, it's cool that he could see it so far out and then it's like, well, if I'm going to lose. You know? I know, I know. No, I know. It's yeah. amazing. And I do, I like, I respect the heck out of that as well. I think it reminds me of, um, like if you're familiar with like Michael Strahan, who does like a lot of like, um, like talk show type things. He was obviously once upon a time, a um, really, really good uh defensive player in the NFL. Yeah. And I remember watching him set the all time sack record. And it was sort of this moment where like he said, I think he sacks Brett Favre. Um, and he goes back and it's like, like the moment, you know, like the moment happens and it's sort of like for all intents and purposes and inside of any game ever, uh, if you, the quarterback are sacked, then, you know, you're, you get up so, sort of clumsily and, you know, the other guys probably over there showboating a little bit and celebrating. Right. And, you know, this was more of like a, like get up and like, give him a hug, like congratulations, yeah. man. <laughs> Everyone like, knew. you know, like give me a little salute there. Like that right. was amazing. Like, you know, I'm glad I got to be a part of like the record setting sack. <laughs> like I was the one. I was the one. <laughs> um, um, so that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. But I could also see, uh, like I could literally, so I'm, I'm, I'm now going back to, to Magnus, um, and like this whole, this whole situation, but it's, uh, it definitely feels like, like you could even see the, uh, the name of the movie about this particular situation oh. being <laughs> called en passant. en passant. That sounds like the name of a chess. Oh, I mean, yeah, of course the chess has such great names for the potential media that could be made around it. Like the queen's gambit is not just like, Oh, it's like, that's a, that's a, that's an opening in chess. Like it's a play. It's a play. That's yeah. like a real play. But of course also Beth Harmon is the queen. But yeah, 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 yeah. No, so, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a twofer. It's a twofer. <laughs> you see what they did? No, but I could, I could totally see that being something like where they would probably for the, for the sake of the theatrics of, or what, of, of it or whatever, like have it be the case that like Ampassant is like one of the first, you know, things that, that he learns is like a young lad getting into, getting into chess or whatever. And it's like reaching the absolute like high height of his like you know chess fame and and all of the rest of it and like there's like all this notoriety around it and like the at the highest stakes level it's like he ultimately goes down but like knows he's going to lose but like lets it play out because right. he's gonna get to see the thing that made him love the game in the first place it's yeah. like like i can just see the whole like it feels like um like a disney made movie like remember the titans type of situation right, yeah um because like similarly like with with the remember the titans team if you've ever watched that movie which is fantastic fantastic and you should if you haven't yes, um sure. but it's it's one of those things where like they they make the titans kind of come across as these like you know like underdogs who need to come together in order to like overcome the circumstances and it's it has the fantastic themes and acting and all the rest of it's really cool and everything but like i think if you actually go back in history and look at it like the titans were virtually unstoppable they were oh, absolutely sure. like amazing that is exactly <laughs> the case yeah like they make it look like they needed some crazy trick play to win with the closing seconds of the game Nuh uh yeah no, no they, it wasn't close it, it was, was a blowout yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, it it doesn't make it not a great story, and and I feel like the 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 real world happenings influencing the existence of the movie, all great things. And then of course, you know, you can you can just like theatric it up a little bit, yeah, yeah, a little more fun. To be fair, I don't think this was like some big championship sort of scenario. That's what I mean. Yeah, like yeah, I think I I think it was just like this was just a game of bullet chess he was playing one day. Right, yeah, right, right, yeah, on stream or something. <laughs> on yeah. stream, yeah. yeah. So like, th this is the equivalent of like the it coming down to a trick play for the Titans. It's like it's like it didn't really come down to a trick yeah. play. It's yeah. like <laughs> it's like we're gonna we're gonna take take this like bullet game of chess on one random day and make it the grand championships of the world. Right, yeah. You know, <laughs> like we'll we'll just tell the story that way. We'll that way, that way. We'll just escalate it. Yeah, yeah. It'll be fine. Happened. It'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a that's a good update. That's a good update. Yeah, I yeah. like to think that we here at the pot maybe like we like we like we launched some. We some Awesome. Yeah, we sent some en passant energy into the world. Just into yeah. the world, yeah. Yeah, so someone, I, I should have written down who sent it, but someone on the Reddit shared that story uh, and like had a video and stuff, so it was cool. Uh, fan, did you watch the video? I watched the video. Was it pretty yeah. cool? Yeah, it was cool. It was fun uh, watching. I yeah. love that. I love yeah. that. Okay, very cool. Uh, moving on to the next. Yeah. All right, transition. Transition. 
All right, Ben, we should probably reveal what the conversational doorknobs are that we mentioned earlier. I I, I feel like, yes. So uh, similarly, somebody actually submitted this. Uh, it's like the psychology of conversations to me. Ah. Um, and it's I think it's a very... So we're going to have a conversation about conversations. We're going to have a conversation about conversations. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and maybe possibly get to the root of... Uh, you have referred to it before as my as my quality. Yeah. Um, which I've always felt like was sort of like your version of like yeah it's a thing about ben (laughs) it's a quality it's a quality it's a good thing right yeah yeah we called it a quality right yeah Yeah, it's 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 a characteristic that's for sure um but no it's it's interesting because i think uh i think it's got like a really cool like root basis so it's an article written by somebody who has uh, a rather tremendous amount of experience in the world of improv and they are effectively taking some of the uh the underlying sentiments about what makes improv as a concept, uh, which in case you are unfam- like unfamiliar with improv, it's basically just unscripted conversation or performance. Yeah. Uh, so it's sort of like nobody really knows where it's going to go, but like because everybody is trained in the act of uh, like knowing how to like pick up where somebody like left off, it, it can usually like be a really fun recipe for like a story that's going to go somewhere that nobody could predict. Right. It's often know? like it's it's very creative and normally very funny. Very funny along the way. Yeah. Yes. And uh, if you've ever actually seen somebody perform improv, it honestly can seem like it's like this is like a miracle happening before my yeah, eyes. It's like, like no one can be this funny this fast. So frequently. Right, right. Yeah. And and I think uh so in in a lot of ways, what this person was was attempting to explain is sort of like the underlying science of conversation that you have out there in the real world and like why sometimes when you interact with somebody, uh you end up having like a very meaningful and like um like bubbly conversation exactly yeah. yeah like it's like it's like everything just like flowed it's like when you met like a like a kindred spirit or something like that you know you're like you meet somebody and it's like man we just like you know we got on like a house you on fire to them yeah. forever yeah. yeah it's just like this is this is so easy so it, it sort of boils down to this idea of um in conversations you could you could maybe even like uh like liken it to um like introverts versus extroverts. Like everybody just sort of has like a different method as to how they interact with others. And it's like one way is not right. One way is not wrong. They're just, they're just different. They're just different. Um, and so you basically have like givers and takers. Um, and I think that the recipe basically ends up being that if you have uh, takers and takers in a conversation, uh, then you are fine. And if you have givers and givers in a conversation, then you are fine. But if you have a giver and a taker in a conversation, that's usually when you kind of like. Yeah, there's a lo- there's a lot of misfires happening all of a sudden. Yes. 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 Um, so do you, do you want to try to explain what both of those terms sure. like look like? Sure, I think I can do it. I okay. read the article once. Okay. Uh, so uh, it sounds like takers are people who are in conversations. It does. It sounds like a bad thing, but it's not. Um, it's just like people who will just assert they don't. They don't wait for an opening in the conversation or be a- or to be asked to talk. They will just sort of like barge in with the next thing they're going to say. Yes. Um, whereas uh, like a, a giver in a conversation might um, have more of like a like like leave a question out there for you like uh, you know what what did everyone think of the movie like that gives everyone an opportunity to talk whereas like a taker might say just like that movie was the worst and i hated it and if you disagree with me then so be it right 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 but like the interesting thing i think between those two particular ideas is that and i I think like again what the author is might be saying is like if you've got the giver who's kind of like granting the opportunity to everybody to like have a voice in the conversation a lot of times what they're saying is that like and and this is like not societal based this is like your group of friends standing outside of the movie theater so for the purposes of 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 that like not trying to like squelch voices or anything like that but like uh i think what they're trying to suggest is that from a conversational standpoint um what will spark conversation more is basically that taker who's going to come in and be like boom i got my opinion let's go from there and like they say the thing and the thing basically like opens doors it gives doorknobs uh like conversational doorknobs if you will for people to reach forward and turn and so it's like uh if you say something like like 
what does everybody think of the movie? You end up in the situation where like six people might all be looking at the person who asked the question and everybody's sort of like, well, I don't want to speak up first. Do you want to speak up first? Right, like, like, I don't want to say like, something that's going to bother other people or something. I- exactly. Yeah. So you're, you're kind of like waiting for someone to like to to start because you don't want to be the one to like lay down your your claim first. They, the the author also likened this to uh, like when you're at like a wedding and there's like an empty dance floor. It's those like bold people who like are like you know what we're going going they're, out they're like, there. Yeah, it, ta- it, ta- started. it takes those first four people. You know those those like you know co- like it's usually I feel like the groomsmen or the bridesmaids or something. You know they do like a fantastic. There's just always those people in the group that are like yeah we're in yeah let's party let's once, go once they're out there they usually like rope in a kid and they you know, the kid starts dancing everybody thinks it's adorable a couple parents come on and. It's just like from there, everybody's having a great time. So right. it, like a lot of times I think it requires these people. So for example, you go back to your movie theater example, you've all walked out of the theater, you're standing around with your group of friends and somebody's like, that movie was the absolute worst. It's like, boom, huge doorknob because right. anybody else in the conversation now, what are they thinking? Right. Either the, it's a great doorknob because either they can latch on and be like, they totally agree with you or they totally disagree with you. Exactly. Yeah. And and where do you go from there? Is like, so like, like, let's say I come out, I say absolutely awful. You go, what? No, it was so cool. Like that action scene at the end between those two people and like, you know, you can then all of a sudden you're right. you're talking about something else. Right. Now you're talking about that. And you're like, oh, we'll see. I don't really like action scenes. I just tune those out because they're so boring. Right, right, right. right. But so then it's kind of like, no, action scene. Like, you know, so you right. can you can immediately see where where all of these things sort of like then lend the conversation to going in like a, a like a much more meaningful uh, way like like once somebody's like basically given an opinion that opinion is like a basis that you can work off of it invites conversation uh, whether it's agreement or disagreement and you know from there you kind of like jump from thing to thing to thing to thing hopefully what you end up with is everybody being able to properly express how they ultimately felt about right. all the various aspects right. of the movie but so like according to this article though like it, they're they are arguing for like um like taker versus like taker taker is like I guess what improv is for the most part. That's the that's the skill they teach you in improv to make sure that someone doesn't get left there having to make up a ton of stuff in a row. That like you are supposed to take the conversation from someone so they can think of their next line while you give your little bit and then they take it back from you. And that's like the point of like uh, making sure you have a good show or whatever. Yeah. But so like in this example, like if you're like, oh, I hated that movie. And like, you think that's a great doorknob because now people can respond to it. But if you had just a taker and then the giver, they might be like, well, why did you hate that movie? Right. You know, and then it's like now they're not really talking and it's just going to keep being about what you thought about it. And the conversation will degrade because uh, I guess the way at least the article close position is that like if you're like a uh, giver conversation kind of person your anticipation when you offer questions like that is that the question will eventually be redirected to you and you'll be allowed to talk and that's how this conversation will work yes and and this is this is where things get dicey so like i know that i've even heard people explain uh this particular like it's it's almost like um it, it's probably more of a miscommunication than anything else, but I, I can definitely think about like a first date being a prime example for a situation like this to arrive. So you both go out to dinner, one person's a giver, the other person's a taker. So the giver all of a sudden starts asking the taker about who they are, what they're up to, what is their job like, what are their stressors? Who is their family? Like, right. you know, and, and for the purposes of the conversation, what, what the giver is attempting to do is grant the other person at the table the ability to talk. They're trying to give them the the springboard. Right. And from the taker's standpoint, you know, like what what they they are distinctly not givers themselves. That's sort of the whole point. So throughout the course of the conversation, it can go a couple of different ways, which can also be the case where you continuously, like you keep answering question after question. You might be sitting there thinking like, man, this person's like, they, they must be so into me right now. Like they, right. Have, they have so many they questions. Know like, all about they want to know everything about me or uh, alternatively, like, and I thought this was another um, like sort of interesting observation from the author is that <laughs> like sometimes if you have this particular situation going on is the giver might be asking all these questions and the taker might be sitting there thinking like, I don't really think my job's that interesting. Why do they keep asking me about it? Like, right, yeah. I don't <laughs> want to keep talking about my job. Right. Like, exactly. You, you know, and the, the thing is, is that it's never occurring to the taker to then. And, and I mean, 
this is black and white. We're definitely like, you know, painting with, with, you know, broad strokes a little bit here. But, um, the idea is that like the, the giver is sort of thinking like, I am asking questions that like, maybe even I would then like to be asked in return. in return. Yeah. Um, however, like it doesn't always read that way. Yeah. And so it's like, if you've ever, if you've ever encountered somebody who you feel like only ever talks about themselves, it could be the case that you and this person engage in this particular in this way, like in this way. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like they only ever talk about themselves. And it's like, I bet you like, it's like, yeah, is like, it possible you ask them questions yeah. and, um, and they're just answering them. <laughs> right. So I, I thought this was, this was particularly interesting. And, and just before me and you hopped on here, we were, we were talking a little bit about, uh, how, how, like, I, th I think, <clears throat> that it must mean i think it must mean that i'm a giver in in conversations i i think so or or possibly maybe uh in a in a broader like less less just conversation basis um just like in in life maybe um and like where i think a portion of like what sometimes does happen to me is like i will go out there and try to like uh you know like show support for someone else's goals or like ask them about like what they've been up to or like what were like what did you get into last night or like you know all all of this type of stuff like trying to always like set people up to like sort of give them something to like feedback right and then the you know the eventual hope is and i'm falling victim to the exact same trap which is sort of like the hope then that the same will then be returned right and it's like but that's that's not like an agreed upon like we didn't have a contract like yeah like that's how the conversation's gonna go e exactly yeah. exactly so sometimes you end up feeling a little bit like miffed at the end of it and it's like well that's like you know th they never knew that that was like the terms under which you were operating under as well so yeah it's I think it's something to be incredibly it's cool because I think if you're aware of it I think it can actually equip you to be a better conversationalist. In just about any circle, I do. I was honestly, it was like a really. Uh, I think it's a good article for people to read because, like, even as I was doing it, I was like, I feel like this is just going to help me have conversations if I can like be more aware of this because I always feel like I'm bad at conversations. <laughs> you think you're? We talk for an hour every single week. Well, let me just say that this is unique. Like you say that you're a giver, and I think in general that's true. But I think inside of the pop, we are both takers. Oh, I, I think got you. you talk differently on the show. That is possible. Yeah, that is possible. Yeah. Well, and, and there's the, the I think that there's a lot of times this is what I love about this show in particular. And and maybe it's even something that like could or should have sharpened my skills in some capacity. I'm not really sure. I'm, I also think that uh, the two year phase of our life where it was very difficult to go and spend time with anybody uh, because of the pandemic. Yeah. You know, certainly I felt like I got like back out into the real world and I'd be like checking out like a cash register or something like that i'm like i don't know what to say am i supposed to be saying something should you be saying something this is just awkward you talk <laughs> like, first you talk first yeah talk first. exactly yeah yeah. yeah yeah it's like the Poe dameron thing from force awakens um and uh so but no i i think you're right because like when you come in when you sit down when you're having this like very meaningful and dedicated conversation it, it like your your brain is a bit more wired to almost like be listening to what you're saying and also in the back of your mind actively be preparing like what I will say sort of in my, in my like reaction. Yeah, to like what are you going to say in response? I think, okay, actually as I'm, I'm thinking about it more about like, like why, what, what about this would make me think I'm not good at conversations or whatever. And I think, I think I probably fall more into like the taker side of things. Okay. But so that means like I would be less likely to be like asking questions or like prying information out of people about like their day or whatever like Pry, that. Just pry just it. Just prying it right. Just, yeah, uh, give me your information. I'm a conversational crowbar. A conversa <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. Just call me crowbar. <laughs> New nickname. New nickname. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but at this, I, so I think maybe what holds me back in conversation a lot is that I don't do a lot of the giving side of things, but then I don't. Uh, so I think I'm more of a taker, but then don't think people care what I have to don't won't think what I have to say is interesting. So then I also don't like take the spotlight in a conversation. Oh, interesting. So then I just end up being like, well, I guess I just won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will sit here quietly. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, that, uh, that is like the type of thing where um I I like desperately desperately would love 
for like to encourage uh, not just you, but just anybody mm -hmm. else who feels that same way. Uh, I tend to, I feel this way. I'm, I, I hope Riley doesn't mind me talking about him here on the pop. Uh, our, our video editor for Super Carlin Brothers is someone who I so often find that like we'll be, we'll be having like a conversation out like, you know, the main area, like over lunch or something like right. that. Yeah. And sometimes I think that Riley finds himself um, like reserved inside of the conversations. But then like, like, so sometimes I will, I will actually like zero in on him. I'm like, Riley, what do you like? I want to know. Yeah. What do you think? And it's because so often I will be sitting there and I'll, I'll feel like I've got like static inside of my brain or like, um, who's the character from Charlie Brown that like always has like the stink no, smell? Pigpen. Pigpen. Uh, like I, I'll sometimes feel like that, like cloudiness is almost like surrounding like all of my thoughts. And I'll, I'll, I'll finally like Riley, like, what do you think? And I'll <laughs> put him on the spot and, um, he'll, he'll talk. And I'm like, yes, that's it. Yes. Like, it's like, it's like, he's not, he, he's not, um, uh, like going to be the loudest person in the room, right, right off the gate or anything like that. But sometimes I just think his thoughts are so like concise and I'm like, that was just such a considerate and thoughtful, like response to the question, you know? Right. And so I'm very appreciative of it, but like, I, you know, at the same rate, you don't ever want somebody to, um, to, uh, like be like, kind of like when, when you go back to like high school or something like that, let's say you're just dazing off into space and your teacher notices and puts you on the spot. You're like, Mr. Carlin what was the last thing I just said. And it was like, Mr. Carlin was the last thing I just said. Boom. Nailed it. <laughs> nailed it. Yeah. High fives all around. High fives Woo, all around. Classic Woo taker energy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> totally solved that problem. <laughs> back at you teach. <laughs> right. Um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, the other, the other big aspect though, I think of, of kind of being a good conversationalist and, and sort of like providing, uh, quality, um, uh, like opportunity for the people you're with to engage is exactly what we talked about earlier. So it's like, you want to create these conversational doorknobs. Yeah. And I think the conversational doorknobs, uh, like in some capacity, you could, you could kind of go and look at that, that example, going back to our movie theater discussion and somebody being like, now, like, let's go around the circle. What did everybody think about the movie? And you might think that those are presenting good quality uh, doorknobs for people to then like grab onto. And yet, in in like a different way, it's also maybe maybe not um, because it it does. Um, what's the best way to describe it? I feel like there was a, there was another example in uh, the in the, in the article and I'm, I'm going to see if I can, if I can pair them together. But one of the things, uh, might be like, let's say I was, I was super into escape rooms and I oh, think, yeah, I that think wasn't the article. Yeah. I yeah. think the article says like, you know, like, I've done 126 escape rooms and like, let me tell you all about how much I love escape rooms and, and paying $35 for someone to, you know, lock me into a riddle room or whatever. Uh, and then you basically get to the, to the end of the conversation and you say, what do you, how do you feel about escape rooms? And the, the idea there is like, it, it sounds like you're presenting them with a great conversational doorknob to like latch on to and like give them the opportunity to speak. But instead what you're really doing is I just spent some time talking about something I love. Now let me hand the mic over to you so you can continue to talk about something I love. Right. You know what I mean? Yes. Like um, you didn't give them a doorknob. You gave them a frictionless surface. Exactly. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That's what it said. That was the article. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I came like, up with that. I, 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 yeah. I'm like, that was genius. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Huh, Absolutely yeah. nailed it. Um, so anyway, that's that's something as well to to and it's it's difficult. You know, like you can you can provide the advice, you can provide the insight. And I think this is where like somebody uh, like improv is a, it's a skill. It's not necessarily, and for some people, I'm sure it is a talent, but like, um, it's the type of thing that you can, you can build on. You can start to figure out like, well, what, what can I say that will start to like crack the door open a little bit right. for, or not even crack the door open, but literally give the knob for the door to be cracked with. Right. Um, which I think is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the and, more I like learn about improv and stuff and in general, like every time I, re I, I feel like, like everyone should be required to take it at some point. I feel like you should have to take improv as part of like your high school curriculum. Like that'll never happen, but you should, you should try to do it because it's just like, it seems so much like a skill that is applicable so far outside of just performing for entertainment. Yes. It's like 
It's like a way to help you think about interacting with people or to realize how people interact. Right, right. Uh, and mm. I feel like the uh, the very the very classic improv <laughs> advice. And I, I like the fact that you sort of uh, gave that qualifier there of not just doing it for like entertainment purposes, because like I do think for me, the part of improv that gives me anxiety is it literally is exactly the very nature of improv it's like i I don't want to perform without a script right like i like if i if i'm going to be in front of people like what if i like this isn't a what if i forget my line situation it's what if i can't think of a line right situation (laughs) and i just and i just blank and i just freeze right um because i i think that 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 feels like worst nightmare situation right uh but the the kind of underlying basis of the most simple rule of improv as far as i know is usually like the sentiment of like yes and right and and so for example again we go back to our movie theater circle you might have a situation where like you know i'll say oh my god that was the worst movie i've ever seen uh and, and like someone else in the conversation if they want to yes and like that would be a great way to to be a taker in that situation uh take the setup that i provided which is that the movie is no good. And then you say, yeah. And the special effects were, you know, did you see when the hammer did the whatever? Yeah. You know, (laughs) and like, like, and, and I think, I think hopefully I'm doing a good job of, of explaining like what that, that basis is. But, um, you know, I think when you bring that to, to conversation, it's almost like when you listen to someone else speak and you, and you try to like spring off of, of like where they've, they've come from. Um, it's just, this is going to be like the recipe for for better and more meaningful conversation yeah. amongst one like one another. Yeah, I, this is this um another thing I feel like I I've I think I might have even talked about this before on the pop. It is like as like a I feel like an improv skill that comes that can uh, apply itself in other ways with like the yes and stuff is like actually parenting. Okay. Yeah, like when I watch the show Bluey, which is of course the the greatest show yeah, for kids yeah. and parents alike. This is the greatest show. No, Ben, it's Bluey. Okay. Bluey is the greatest show. Got it. Yeah. Jeez. That, that makes sense. Come on. <laughs> now, I feel like if you watch this show, though, and you pay attention, like the parenting style is almost yes and. Okay. Like, no matter what the kids come up to with the parents, like they will always just like accept it. Like, what's the situation? Yes. This is, these are the rules of the game. And now I'm adding this to it. And then what are you adding back to it? Okay. And now this is part of the game. But it's never like, mm, actually, you're playing the game wrong. What if we did it this way instead? Right. You know, it's like there's never any just like you're doing it wrong. It's just like, yes, this is how. And then like, you know, of course, it's written. So that always it always just so happens that the situation resolves itself such that the kids learn exactly the lessons the parents want them to. And, sure. And that's always like the Well, that doesn't always work out in real life and stuff like that. But, right. uh, you know, it, it's a it's a very nice sentiment. And I do find like there are times where I'm like, I really just like try and embrace that. Like we talked about the chess earlier last night, like. You know, it'd be so easy to just be like, no, now, Luke, that's not how the knight moves. You can't just take a piece every turn. OK, right. Like, you know, I know he knows that. But in the meantime, he's just like he's just having fun playing. Yes. And th- I think the more important thing is that he remembers having fun playing chess with his dad, not being like a stickler for the rules w- with your five year old who doesn't really understand strategy. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. And and I think that's really what you've done a great job in that situation of of promoting like it's like as time goes on, if he continues to pursue chess as an activity, which I think there's a greater likelihood to if every time he plays with you, he has a positive experience. Right. I think at some point in time, what he would end up doing is finding himself wanting to play by the rules of the game uh, for the basis of like, because that is that that ultimately like would be how you enjoy the game of chess in the most meaningful way. Yeah. The alternate situation here is that you would find yourself in a situation where he uh, becomes more of like someone who loves inventing alternative games to rules. Right. uh, Rules to games. Yeah, I got that right the second time, I think. Um, And the idea there could be something like, like, for example, with with Pokemon, uh, you have played uh, like the Nuzlocke variation of, of the playthrough. And it's like literally what you are doing is taking user made up rules right to approach the game differently and right. the game doesn't enforce those rules you enforce, you enforce those rules, rules. yeah it's, it's not like you're turning a mode on or anything like that so you know if luke finds a way to to reinvent the game of chess by having that night piece in the middle like 
like that can that can do this this you know unusual op power uh if he can find a way to to get that to work that only happens i feel like because because he wasn't jaded from his experience of, right, of yeah. playing the game yeah, you don't want age. him to just dislike the experience right and it's like it is funny though because there are things like i wouldn't think he's really like i don't think he's thinking moves ahead and trying you know really checkmate the king he's mostly concerned with like you know like how can i steal every turn yes I mean, and a lot of times they're like well you can take this pawn but i will take you back you know? right, right right yes yeah <laughs> like, yeah and I'm, then i'm gonna have your queen and then it's just over and then, you know? it's, <laughs> then it's just over but like last night we you know we're like before the game devolved into um you know the the super the super rapid ash <laughs> yeah right 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 <laughs> um he was like uh you know he's like trying to figure out like what all the pieces were and he's like okay this one's the knight and i was like he's like where can this one move and i was like okay it can go to one of these two spots and he's like oh yeah and he puts it on one and he goes no wait and he moves it back to the other one he goes these don't like being on the edge and i'm like that is right knights do not like being on the edge of the board oh interesting like, like oh you like listened to me say that like that is you very... do know where they go okay so let me let me pose this as well as in addition to to your yes and parenting style because yeah. I'm, I'm just I'm, i feel like we're on a roll right now well, let's go uh is like i know that one of the things that you have told me on many occasions is that luke uh himself likes to uh prolong his bedtime routine as much There's as possible no though, doubt about that as much opportunity as he can to hang out with you uh before before he goes to bed this might take any variety of different forms i think you've said it's been like can i read another book or can we talk about our day um oh, yeah. you know and he, i mean and this is why he likes chess too because it takes longer that's exactly what i was yeah. going to say <clears throat> is that the better he ultimately gets at chess the longer this nighttime ritual will go yeah. because like all of us, you know, a game of chess can take a long time. Oh, it absolutely can. And that's like, this is, this is like a line I have to draw sometimes. Cause I'm like, look, I, like I can just win, you know, like I'm like, you know, <laughs> like right. he's not really trying to win and he's not going to see what I'm setting up at all. <laughs> right. It's right, very right. easy to just be like, boom, I went. Or conversely, sometimes I will, uh, you know, I like to make sure like he likes stealing pieces. So I'll just like make bad moves so that he can steal a piece. Or of whatever. course. Yeah. And then it'll be like sometimes or or I'll set it up such that, um, you know, I can be like, Luke, ooh, Luke, there's a way you can move your rook right now and you can get checkmate. And you want to be like, no, I don't want to win. I want it to take longer. <laughs> right, <laughs> it's right. It's like, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I see what's happening. I see. Yeah, My yeah. plan has failed. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. But just so you know, if you move your rook right here, that's checkmate. So I'm just... Rook, and then we can go to bed. All right, let's go. <laughs> Bedtime. <laughs> Bedtime. The thing is, here's my <clears throat> suspicion, is that once and when uh, Luke does start to become very competitive at games, my suspicion is that the issue isn't going to be uh, that you want Luke to go to bed, and it's going to be that Beth wants you to come and hang out. That could uh, totally be the it, problem. It's like, all right, that's enough bedtime for one night. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's enough enhancing our minds by way of strategic chess play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At some point, it's just going to be, yeah, this is the thing. It's, we need to watch Bachelor paradise downstairs with popcorn and wine <laughs> that's right oh my gosh that doesn't, doesn't sound like a terrible evening no yeah, of no, course not sounds fantastic yeah i feel like at some point it's gonna be i feel like it could if if it gets the point where it's very competitive like hold on <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly i have to think about this move beth <laughs> he's got me he's on the ropes right now ropes over here i'm down three pawns <laughs> that's losing right there anyway but is that right if you're I, down not, three pawns not necessarily but um, it probably depends on which pawns in the rest of the board state, but mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's mm -hmm. not looking great. <laughs> okay, okay, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do feel like uh, you are, you are well on the way to, um, uh, like a very, uh, what is the when the when the student becomes the pastor mm -hmm. i feel like you are setting yourself up for it i am so okay with it the grandest I, way it's I, the way we talk about chess on this show you'd think i play it all the time and i absolutely don't and that i've been playing it all the time for my whole life which is very not true but i do like chess um and i i think back sometimes to like when we would be like in vermont or something uh -huh. and like you know uncle chad or will or something would be like oh you want to play a game of chess? And I'd be like, of course I do. <laughs> yeah, Let's I go. It's like, <laughs> absolutely. Obviously. And I never won. I like, and like, when I think back to those games, I remember winning and I can't like, and like in the moment, it made me feel like very good. Like I just beat an adult at chess. Right. And like, I think back and I'm like, were they letting me win or did they just get really surprised or 
I and like I'll never know, you know. N- right. <laughs> it's it's a very difficult one, and uh, it's this has been interesting. I think, uh, and in, probably in some ways validating for me uh, as a human being as I've gotten older, is uh, the discovery that I think your strategic play at things is a lot more sophisticated than than like your than what might have happened as a result of our age difference, if that makes sense. Um, like I think there was certainly a considerable amount of like when I was five and you were seven, like you could beat me at Monopoly because the difference between five and seven was significant enough that like I probably didn't know what all the words on the page meant. Right. You know, yeah, or sure. like like I like certainly you didn't at five. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, I did I wasn't really like, you know, put it like putting together the strategy in the most coherent way. But then you would also think that as time went on, things would have like eventually found like a happy equilibrium. And to to, like, even on that note, it's entirely possible that I was just so I was beaten down so badly as a child (laughs) that like, by the time that that stage even arrived, I was just like, I'm done. (laughs) I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. (laughs) That's what, that's what getting older means is I get to say no. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Um, No decisions. But no, I do think that there is a strong possibility that you were winning those games of chess uh, because I think you just have like a knack. I'm not even a knack, a knack but like but like a like a passion for it. Right, like, I, like I think sure. it it's something you you put like a lot more deliberate thought into. Like even the thought. I mean, Luke's got me beat already. If he knows knights don't like edges, that's not something I do at all. <laughs> uh, and being down three pawns, I was like, that makes a difference. Yeah. Like <laughs> like huh, they're just pawns, Jay. Just it's, pawns. Not, it's not like we're down three rooks. Yeah. <laughs> there are three rooks, right? <laughs> I know yeah. there's not three rooks for yeah, what it's worth. No, yeah. There's not, right? <laughs> I mean, in total on the board at the start of the game, there are four the, rooks. Right, but, yeah. But you can't <laughs> but you be down only have three. Two. I guess you could have like a promoted pawn that you turned into a rook for a reason and then lost that too. Okay, I, for what it's worth, I would be down know. three. So that, that happens when a pawn makes it all the way across the board, right? Yeah, yeah. And and you all, would you always pick a, pick a rook? You would absolutely only ever pick a queen or a knight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's no reason to not. I mean, there's almost no reason not to just choose queen because that's easily the best piece. The only reason you wouldn't choose queen is because where that pawn is, if it turns into a knight, can attack, can like specifically attack the king in a way that a queen from that exact position could not. Okay. So here's another one for yeah. you. Is that like when I was in chess club, when I was in like fourth grade or fifth grade or whatever, when I, whenever I was doing it, um, I feel like. Uh, in addition to just trying to uh, enact en passant as much as I possibly could. Yeah. The other thing I feel like I was constantly trying to do was placing the strategy of just getting my pawns across the board right. above all else. Yeah. Well, so, this is why you would be in a losing position if you were down three pawns, because the likelihood that your opponent is going to promote one of them is massive. Okay. Gotcha. 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 Yeah. Okay. I, I, told, I too figured that out there completely <laughs> on my own. But thank you for explaining it to everybody at home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, no problem. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm looking out for the little kernels. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Very, very considerate and thoughtful of you indeed. Yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, no, I feel like um, on the on the whole, yeah, I, this, is, this is sort of like the thing that I feel like we keep coming back to because like we've talked about improv. We've talked about this idea of, of like, you know, probably even for the purposes of this show for the purposes of like the J versus Ben's or like any of the other things that we're doing where we're like on camera together. Uh, we even do some like in, in person performance type things on yeah. occasion. And the good news is, is that you and I in particular have spent so much time doing this stuff specifically together that I think right. we, we kind of know how to like lean yeah, on each other like, a little bit. Like, but yeah, roll off each other's cues and stuff. Precisely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think beyond that, like as someone uh, personally, who just absolutely loves conversation. Like, I I think it's something that I would love to see, um, like, promoted more or even just something that, like, I would like to learn more about myself so that, like, I can better engage with people inside of conversation. Like, uh, like I tried to already do my best. Like, if I'm in a room, like I said, like, with Riley, for example, um, I tried to, like, see if there's somebody who seems like they're, like, watching the conversation but not speaking and, like, almost, like, being, like, the advocate for that person to have a chance to say something. Yeah. Um, but, of course, <gasps> like, you know... Uh, 
it's not infallible and it's you know it's it's hard to know it's hard to know if that person even wants to speak up or if they want to be having the conversation at all in the first place sure is is another huge aspect of it and so the thing i'd like to close out with is there's this last sentiment that i feel like uh did come up inside of the same exact article and it was almost like music to my ears to see someone else say it um because like one of the big things i feel like if you know me in any capacity uh and i'd be curious to like mike and steven who i spend a lot of time with as well uh in person outside of the pop here uh know this about me you know this about me is that i like to have deep conversations Mm -hmm. um and it's something that like even alice you know this morning uh we were like you know getting ready and like setting up um addy for uh uh, like breakfast and we're still like making coffee and like i start like lobbing these like you know hard-hitting questions at her and i was like i was like you're not you're not saying very much and she's like i haven't had any coffee yet and these are really big thoughts (laughs) and i was like yeah that's fair that's That's fair um but uh so the the sentiment that was expressed and then uh i i actually it was like it was linked uh and i was like that's kind of interesting because it was like a source statement okay um it said we overestimate the awkwardness of deep talk and so we stick to the boring uh affordanceless shallows and so i uh affordance is is like a technical term for doorknobs right is, for all intents and purposes so without the rest of the context of of the of the um the article that's that's why it uses that particular word um but this is something that i i think that there's a chance that maybe like is that quality that I might have figured out like um, organically, accidentally. Uh, maybe it's just so, like sort of like more innately like who I am as an individual, uh, like in terms of the way that I do communicate with other people, uh, which is that like I don't think that I has like I don't need to know you for very long at all to like dip my toe into the deep end of a conversational pool. Sure. Um, and I think that there, uh, there's a, there's a certain amount of being the first person inside of a conversation to show a degree of vulnerability is surprisingly, uh, a rather considerable affordance. If you want to use the technical term or doorknob for, someone else Mm -hmm. because i think sometimes this idea of exposing yourself or showing that vulnerability inside of a conversation uh has a high risk high reward basis to it there's the high reward uh scenario which is that you have a great and meaningful conversation but the high risk situation of being vulnerable inside of a, a conversation is revealing something that you might feel deep down revealing an opinion you might have that you're not like sure or you're comfortable expressing or not right and effectively or being ridiculed ridiculed or or else or else uh, offending someone else in that way exactly yeah yeah um uh i think i think what i'm getting better at as time goes on is um realizing the the grand possibility that is somebody inside of the circle feels differently about a thing than the way that I do. And what I think that that has done, what that has allowed me to do is to speak, um, hopefully in like a, in that sort of like taking kind of manner, like, like sort of almost like providing the, those, those conversational doorknobs, but maybe not doing it in such a way that might also cause someone inside of a conversation to feel then, isolated Mm -hmm. and this is where i feel like there's some fine tuning for sure to be done because obviously feelings can be hurt pretty quickly even if it's just difference of opinion about how we felt about that movie that we just watched sure you know so if you're standing again with your group of people at the movie theater at the end of the thing and you go out there and and it's like again you're not asking like what did everybody think but you're saying like oh my gosh that movie was the absolute worst now if you say something like that it does also then create the potential issue which is um like if somebody enjoyed it they might now feel a little bit like embarrassed embarrassed or right. or or silly or like m- maybe this is a situation where it's like you need to figure out what that fine line is or or be aware of that fine line even that like by by providing a potential conversational doorknob for someone to latch onto you also need to know like the other potential ramifications of what that strong opinion might be right in in the meantime um so it's 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 all just very interesting because i i i love 
the world where the um the those doors can be open for good quality like in safe conversation. I, I feel like um that's that's the type of thing that really allows for like ideas to be to be carried from like one person to the next in uh the most successful way. Sure. Like yeah. uh, you know, a lot of times I've I've posed this idea before like like there's there's like super genius Albert Einstein, right? And it's like if you were to take like any three people and combine their uh, like all of their knowledge into like one brain. And now all of a sudden I have like, let's say all of the knowledge that you have inside of your brain and all of the knowledge that like Ethan, the editor has inside of his brain. It's like, do I like, is that filling in so many potential gaps of knowledge that I now become like a super genius all of a sudden? Like, like literally it just tastes like, like three brains is more than three times as powerful as one brain because you right, have like more than the, um, what is that called? Synergy. Synergy. Yeah. yeah more than the sum, more of, than the sum of the parts. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, and that, because that's what I think the value of good conversation truly is, is like, is basically getting to, uh, provide all of those shared experience, provide all that shared knowledge and literally make every single person better at once. So that that's like the quest that I feel like in So when life, you're having a conversation, you're trying to better everybody in the conversation? Yes. I've literally never thought about it that way. Really? At all. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no, I like this <laughs> is this is um it for me so often I feel like it's the it's the like you know, don't be afraid to ask a question because chances are someone else in the class is thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times if I find myself like stuck on like a piece of current events or something like that, and it's like, I'm posing a question to the group. It's almost like there's a part of me that like genuinely has the question myself. Uh, but then the other part of me is almost like, I want to know how everybody else is thinking about this particular thing. Mm -hmm. Because like I do what that, what that does is provides me insight to perspectives that, you know, it's like, there's no chance that I can think of it through through the lens of your eyes right. necessarily. So it's like I, I need to know like where your head's at it. Like what have you read about it? Like what what other pieces of like intangible about like who you are as a person has provided you your unique perspective and how can your unique perspective help not only just me but anybody else inside of the conversation. But the biggest thing that I find with these conversations that I see more and more and more that I've seen happen in the past week of my particular life is that I just think that every single person I have one of these conversations with is 100% sure that I'm trying to trap them inside of the conversation mm. into saying something that like is indefensible in some capacity. Right. And so like a lot of times what will happen is it's like, if I feel like I'm getting like on the edge of something, like I will push uh, more inside of the conversation to see like, like what else do you have to say about that? Like, give me more. And, and you do reach that, that, that point where it's kind of like, like this is where trust is very important. It's like, you need to know that like, I am not, I am not like coming after you. Like what I am trying to do is like, it's like, Oh my gosh, like we're onto something here. Like, this mm -hmm. is cool. Right. Like we're, we're doing this. You know, mm -hmm. like, we're, we're understanding her or like maybe like, you know, my perspective could have been entirely wrong or uninformed. Right. And, and now like, now look at us. Right. <laughs> better i it is is it possible that if you feel like people are constantly feeling like like you're trying to trap them that like your approach needs to alter yes absolutely yeah, yeah. no there's there's no doubt about that but like this is the um this is why i was so glad when i just saw it in writing is like the we we overestimate the awkwardness of deep talk mm -hmm. the the thought is like oh people don't want to talk about deep stuff mm -hmm. you know but it's like i think the the what I would argue, what I would, what I would push for is like, is, is to engage in it because I do think that there's so much to be gained from it. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I clicked the article, I'm going to read it because I feel like it, I feel like it has some good sauce inside of it and you okay. tell me what you think. Okay. All right. All right. If I'm boring you, then, then that's okay. Um, the guy has a, a really, um, Schopenhauer, I believe, is is how it's pronounced. Schopenhauer, yeah. Uh, so Schopenhauer argued that people want it want deeper and more intimate relationships, but are reluctant to pursue them because they expect their greater intimacy will be unpleasant. These expectations, in turn, discourage intimacy, entrenching the uh, entrenching the politeness and fine manners of small talk as the norm in everyday discourse. So, like. To me, th what this is saying, and, you know, this is, of course, just one person who wrote one thing, but that's sort of like, 
in lieu of deep conversation, we sort of like, we kind of stick to the, the fine manners to use the, the verbiage here to just sort of be like, so what's up? What'd you do? What'd you get into? Right. You know, and it's sort of like that conversation doesn't ever really end up broadening your horizons a whole lot right at all it's i mean it's like reading a status update you know yeah like i think it just sounds like very situational as well though to me like it says like uh it says uh are you people want deeper more intimate relations but are reluctant to pursue them because they expect greater intimacy will be unpleasant and it's like i think for an extent that's true but like like i think a lot of times people maybe that's not it's not always true that people want more intimate relationships with people for like very like maybe for various reasons like like if you have if you work in an office with like 10 coworkers like it might be just smarter in general not to have like deeper deep relationship co- yes. with your like every coworker True. like that might not be smarter if you're like like boss versus like you know employee it's like th- those sort of there's like lines there that make it so it's like it's better if it's less intimate because otherwise a lot of weird boundaries start getting crossed right <coughs> in right. situations as well and and that's that that's also an incredibly good and valid point to bring up as well is that like there is you're you're precisely right like the the very existence of like a professional environment sort of always has its own natural ebbs and flows and you know sort of like things that happen and everything and so it's like it very well could be the case that it's like yeah when you go up and you're talking to your your buddy at the water cooler or whatever it's like I don't know so I don't know that we necessarily need to have deeper conversation than like what'd you think of Game of Thrones last night right yeah you know it's like like sometimes that's probably like more than satisfactory right um so probably probably what a lot of people who engage with me on a regular basis are are at the mercy of is is probably on some level the uh the byproduct of being a fairly new parent coming out of a pandemic and it's like i just need someone to talk to yeah, talk to somebody <laughs> man i need a person yeah so anyway um that's where i'm at i'd be curious to hear all of your thoughts at home if you have any feedback for the show you can send it over to popcorn culture pod at gmail.com or if you'd like to support us on patreon we have some really cool tiers over there including our five dollar tier which includes after the final pop it's an extra 15 to 20 minutes of jay and i talking after each week's episode usually we tackle something that we didn't already get to in the main episode from our show notes Mm -hmm. or we expand on a topic we talked about talk about something new entirely like volcanoes or something that seems like something we could discuss potentially in today's episode of after the final pop we sure could you can check that out at patreon.com slash popcorn culture otherwise until next time pop pop (laughs) 